Well, our talks frequently range over different periods of history. We love to extract peculiar details from the historical record and speculate <coughs> on their relationship to major movements in cultural history. So today we get to do this with modern history, with cultural history in our own lifetime, for our subject is psychedelics and the computer revolution. There have been several articles in the journals recently, in newspapers, speculating on connections between the, uh, the onset of the psychedelic period and discoveries in the computer revolution. But it only came to my attention very recently through an article in GQ. And for this article, I was interviewed on the subject, my usual subject, of complex dynamical models for uh, history, for social, economic, political systems, and their potential for aiding a uh, jump start on uh, the future. When the interview finally appeared in the magazine, however, it wasn't about that at all. It was a speculation on the psychedelics and the computer revolution. And this, this article somehow had evolved, I think, from my connection with Mondo 2000. So this is a magazine that we, we all know. Uh, we know the editors, we met them here, in fact, at Esalen. And this uh, magazine had evolved through uh, stages with different names, High Frontiers, Reality Hackers, Mondo 2000, as if we are working on High Frontiers, we are hacking reality, we are creating the future, and we are aimed at Mondo 2000. And as a matter of fact, we, we do. Our trialogues are very much in this spirit. And the magazine apparently owes its existence to a market of um, fans of psychedelics who work in the computer revolution. But the idea of the causal connection between psychedelics and the computer revolution, this, this was new. The article in GQ begins with an excellent uh, quote from Timothy Leary, who says, there are various natural resources in the world. Creativity is one of them. And understanding this, the Japanese would go to Borneo to uh, collect teak and go to California to collect creativity. So this is the conjecture we can consider this morning. And to begin with, to, to see about the plausibility of a causal role, let's look at the comparative chronologies of these two developments. All happened in our lifetimes and largely here in California. So this is the, the, lo the location if we are going to find a connection and we can dig it up in the, in the wreckage in the basement of the local church and so on. So the computer revolution began in World War II or you can put the beginning anywhere, but what we call the computer revolution began in World War II among people who probably did not take psychedelics. In fact, the psychedelic revolution started later. To begin with, the early computers were war machines. One was called the Norton bomb site, then there's the Enigma machine, and so on. I was in grade school at that time. Then, um, the psychedelic revolution, let's say, started in the middle 60s. What's going on in the computer revolution in the middle 60s? We had the beginnings of a field called, now called scientific computation. The first computers weren't used for scientific computation, except as a special purpose analog computers like the Norton bomb site, all designed around a single mathematical problem. General purpose scientific Computation required first the invention of floating point numbers by Wilkinson in 1961. So there is a conjunction in these two chronologies between uh, 
let's say, the first uh, popular usage of marijuana and, and uh, the arrival of LSD on university campuses and so on. Not to say that Wilkinson was an acid head, but this is, anyway, looking for causal links, we have to pay attention to the comparative chronologies. Then, uh, Just a couple of years later, when LSD hit the college campuses, computer graphics began uh, its major uh, growth from seeds planted in Salt Lake City with Evans and Sutherland and so on. And uh, the usage of computer graphic hardware required software that was developed later by various people whose names are not well known. And uh, whether they used psychedelics or not, we couldn't say, but certainly a lot of their friends did because that was the cultural, historical milieu of the time. A later development in the 1970s, then um, psychedelic mushrooms became popular on university campuses, and at this time there was a major change in the direction of the computer revolution in the emphasis, in the shift of emphasis from mainframe computers to personal computers. The, uh, of course, this was a corporate decision in IBM, as the historians see it. But actually, it was the Macintosh that more penetrated homes and became the first successful personal computer, and that was because of the Macintosh operating system, which was stolen from Smalltalk. A, uh, one of the many very creative projects at Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center in the 1970s. There are also, we found uh, other innovations in computer graphic software, such as the first paint program and uh, the postscript method of, of doing typographics. More recently in the, the 80s, we had the decline of hardcore psychedelics of the onset of the, uh, what do you call it, empathogens, mm. like ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And then we find a new turn in the computer graphic revolution toward virtual reality and uh, other uh, software developments which would replace the uh, ordinary reality with um, an alternative reality, if not psychedelic, at least equally distant from ordinary reality. So there's a parallel a, a chronology, and this suggests some conjectures, only chronological conjectures, not necessarily making much sense, such as a causal relation between LSD and the first computer graphic software. Likewise, between um, the popularity of psychedelic mushrooms and the personal computer revolution, or at least is empowerment, the GUI, the graphical user interface, such as Smalltalk. Also at that time, there was, uh, at least in university campuses, a massive growth in interest by children in computer games. And the first ones were in the Dungeon and Dragons category, which is still popular. Uh, circulating computer networks worldwide, more and more and more developments of uh, sophisticated computer games like Dungeons and Dragons, Adventure, and so on, where you you go down a little corridor, you come to, you can choose between this door or lifting that rock, and then you drop vertically. And it's a computer graphic alternate reality is the substance of the game. A lot of important evolution. In, uh, computer software concepts took place in the milieu of, of these computer games. Also, the source code was available on the large networks, so children could learn computer programming and modify the games. And so the evolution, I mean, the, cult the cultural history and the evolution of this game milieu were uh, co-evolutionary processes. And finally, a causal relationship between ecstasy and the emphasis on virtual reality, which is now being developed with uh, great enthusiasm by governments for purpose of driving tanks, weapon systems, and, and, and making love, operating business, telecommuting, and, and so on, it could be viewed as a um, quantum leap 
in the interconnectivity between the machine and the human user. So here are just some possibilities for causal relation between uh, psychedelics and creativity in the computer industry. And I think just to fasten on one uh, possible nucleus of all this is uh, Xerox Park, is a place where some of the very important software concepts developed, and it's in it's in Palo Alto, centrally located in the in Silicon Valley, and in the midst of the, uh, the central marketplace of of the psychedelic culture. What do you think? Well, I I mean I gather that the causal connection between all this is the idea that both the evolution of the computer and the evolution or rediscovery and assimilation of psychedelic drugs has to do with consciousness expansion. I mean, in one case, we're expanding memory, retrieval speed, uh, machine-human interfacing. In the other frontier, the pharmacological frontier, we're expanding uh, our exploration of our own wetware and that probably the end result of this is to see these two uh, superficially distinct fields as actually two facets of a single set of concerns that are migrating toward each other. I mean, I suspect, I assume, that the drugs of the future will be much more like computers, and the computers of the future will be much more like drugs, and that, in fact, the values and the uh, areas that each seeks to maximize are similar to the areas of concern of the other. The final goal of reductionist pharmacology if it's able to make good on its belief that the basis of thought is ultimately molecular, should be the designing of a drug which causes you to whistle the first eight bars of Dixie and nothing else. Similarly, uh, the goal of computers, uh, given the nanotechnological thrust, the human interfacing thrust, and so forth and so on, is a computer that you can run its programs only by placing it uh, under your tongue. So that, you know, these two concerns, one, the concern of a kind of magical, shamanistic, emotion-based, we could almost say feminine psychology, the drugs, is a countervailing force to the uh, uh, material... Uh, engineering, hardwired, scientific, uh, straight engineering approach. But in fact, it seems that the Ouroboros is taking its tail in its mouth, and uh, these two concerns are seen to be simply different approaches to the completion of the same program of knowledge. Well, that's very nice. It, it's a little less than I wanted. This is the kind of a theory of convergent evolution or something. See, so I'm thinking of uh, the machines had evolved in a certain way. They could have evolved some other way. Why would they do this way? Because the interest in people making the innovations. Now, if those are people who um, specifically are having visual hallucinations on a regular basis, then it's possible that they would be more inclined to have a, a GUI, a graphical user interface icon on the screen. I mean, we have all these books. There's hardly an illustration in them. We'll have an encyclopedia dictionary. Here's the definition of the word tree. There's no picture of a tree there. Now we look at them at the Macintosh or at Smalltalk or the uh, Sun operating system. Here are icons all over the place. Every concept is represented by a picture. There's very few words in sight. Could that be because the people making the creation are strongly influenced by an alternate reality in their own life, and therefore computers are evolving in a re direction that is quite orthogonal from the preceding uh, direction and vector of cultural history? 
Well, print had a series of sensory biases uh, and intellectual biases built into it that print culture was always extraordinarily naive about. I mean, it, because of print, we have the concept of interchangeable parts, uh, which gives permission for the concept of democracy. That's an interchangeable parts theory. The citizen is an interchangeable part in the body politic. Because of print, we have uh, the glorification of Cartesian logic and the uh, emphasis on the uh, here and now aspects of reality. I mean, I think that what's happening now was very presciently anticipated by Marshall McLuhan, who felt that the electronic media would return us to an eye-oriented culture and that the biases that have shaped the Western mind since the adoption of the phonetic alphabet, essentially, and that were then tremendously intensified by movable type is all being exploded. The Gutenberg galaxy of cultural effects is being left far behind as we move out into a space that we could call psychedelic, visual, cybernetic, or all three. Well, one uh, approach would, would be to say, yes, we had uh, repression of fantasy thanks to the print medium dominating because the technology of the Gutenberg press and so on uh, for a time. And then we had a liberation through the revival of visual representations thanks to electronic innovations in the medium world. Uh, for example, television and the main influence behind the graphical explosion in the computer revolution is not psychedelic uh, visual hallucinations at all, but just the rise of popularity of television in the American home. Well, it's all of a piece. I mean, television, e yes, I mean, television is certainly uh, has a tremendous influence on the mass mind, but on the creative cutting edge of the civilization, it's psychedelics. Television influences culture, but if you watch television, it's psychedelics that shape the agenda of television, the styles of uh, cutting and rapid fire imagery and macrophysical and microphysical perspective shift and all of these things uh, one could lay at the feet of psychedelics. Now what an orthodox cultural historian would claim is it's not psychedelics, it's uh, surrealism. Surrealism is always dragged in here as the godfather of modern advertising. But in fact, the concern of surrealism is nothing less than the pictorial representation of the contents of the unconscious as described by Freud and Jung. So what it, in a way, what we're talking about here is not so much the culture shaping power of psychedelics or television or surrealism, but of the emergence as a cultural artifact of the unconscious itself, yeah. which was being suppressed by this linear print uh, head style of thinking. Yeah. So, that so visual representations, for example, have been relegated to the unconscious through the restrictions of the media. Well, they've always well, been like, the medium the by which the... Psychedelics, they are released from the unconscious and enter as if all people had suddenly become surrealist artists. The databases of the unconscious are visually dedicated databases. They're not print databases. And now they are being liberated into consciousness. Really, I mean, as a global society possessing, you know, DNA sequencers and thermonuclear delivery systems and so forth and so on, we cannot have the luxury of an unconscious mind. That's something that may or may not have some appropriateness if you're hunting woolly mastodons and that sort of thing. But an integrated global culture cannot have uh, the luxury of a large portion of its uh, mind inaccessible to itself and somehow occluded and apparently 
this is being eliminated. It, technology, the evolution of languages and so forth have taken a turn toward outing the unconscious. Outing the unconscious. And this is, computers are a wonderful tool for this, yes. as are psychedelic drugs. Yes, and so they are in cooperation in um, a crash program to out the unconscious. In other words, to increase the strength of the coupling and the effect of resonance um, between ourselves and conscious purpose in our society on the one hand and the cultural morphogenetic field on the other hand. The species mind is being made explicit by entering into the visual awareness of uh, individuals. And through these means, when the connection between the, the group mind and the business practice and so on is amplified, then we get commercial manifestation of creativity, of products like the personal computer. Well, but in a sense, I think that's simply that the culture is building on the foundation already in place. Money as understood by moderns is almost entirely a print created phenomenon. Before the invention of the printing press, money was something that you hid under your mattress. Now money is this completely abstract medium that is moved around by electronic banking transfer and uh, investment capitalism and this sort of thing. And it has become like the concept of the citizen a way to uniformize uh, all the complex spectrum of phenomena down to a single variable, money. And so the world of print is the world based on money. Now, the computer is very able to insinuate itself into that environment and build on it, but that isn't, I think, the natural milieu of the computer. The co natural milieu of the computer is information, which is very different from money. Money is a downloading of complexity into a kind of medium of exquisite simplicity. Information is an exploding of the apparent here and now into a much more uh, multidimensional domain that is therefore, it can only be grokked intuitively, it can only be grokked through feeling. So the abandonment of money and the substitution of information as a medium of exchange is having a feminizing, psychedelicizing, and visually enhancing effect on the, the values and direction that society is going. And this is all happening without planning, I think. This is just built in. These are the hidden agendas of the technologies that we imagine we can manipulate and appropriate without being reinfected by the hidden effects that they carry. But in co of course, this is not true at all. We are completely now infected by these hidden assumptions. What do you make of this, Rup? Well, <clears throat> I like the idea of the reemergence of the unconscious. And um, it reminds me of the... Um, presumably the prototypic image of the realization of um, <clears throat> archetypal images in some kind of shared space is the cave art of the Paleolithic where you go deep into a cave and there by the flickering light of candles after a scary initiatory journey accompanied by chanting and so on you see these images of animals and so on um, um, a vision actually somehow made concrete within a shared space through a flickering light in the darkness. Well, I understand that um, <clears throat> of the um, Native Americans who went into this kind of thing, the Shumash were particularly well known for their polychrome cave paintings. They occupied the area now known as Hollywood. Well, the, um, the flickering light, the polychrome cave paintings, of course, give one uh, an early version of the cinema. 
and the cinema where you go into a darkened space and then by flickering light see incredible fantasies and patterns unfolding on the wall um, is in some sense the precursor of television. Television is like the cinema writ small and brought into every home. And certainly in countries where television is introduced for the first time, like India, uh, the principal use people make of it is, is nowadays is, is videos of films. You can have all these films at home. So it's like a miniaturized cinema. So I think if we're looking at the history of this sort of revival of the collective uh, visual imagination, the cinema is the precursor we have to look at rather than television. And of course, California again plays a crucial role in this revolution. Well, the so the cinema television, psychedelics as uh, another form of darkened space and uh, uh, flickering, flickering image. images and visual uh, content um, and the um, computer graphic revolution which in a sense is like a transformed television on the cinema to be able to represent more abstract um, kinds of imagery or pattern of the kind that may appear in psychedelic uh, vision um, these, these seem to be related kinds of phenomena. So, if we see this as all some kind of uh, reawakening of the uh, visual imagination and the representation of the unconscious phenomena, the prototype for all of which is, of course, the world of dreams, which occur in darkness, in sleep, indoors, usually. Um, and in a flickering and, and um, incomprehensible way. Then the real roots is the world of dreams, and then its actualization or externalization through cave art, and then through these variety of other transforms, you know, fairy tales told around campfires, again, the flickering light associated with the play of the imagination and of imagery conjured up in that case by words. But then the uh, visual representation of all these things shows indeed some kind of connection. So. I think you're right that we can see this as part of a larger process of um, reawakening of a collective imagination. Um, it's part of an archaic revival. The, the print thing mm -hmm. is very artificial and yeah. we live completely the within it. The thing is very artificial. Well, I don't see that so clearly. I mean, the print thing is a technological artifact less than 500 years old and yet dominating the sensory ratios and psychologies of virtually every person on Earth. Of scale. We have a million years of, of, of consciousness and then we have only uh, 50 or 100,000 years of speech. Speech is a newcomer on the scene. Our the morphic field barely recognizes words. But words are still an incredibly deeply established creed compared with written words or print. Yes. And if you look at non-literate cultures, then of course the oral tradition is very important, but I suppose also there's a much higher developed visual imagination. When you go to a Hindu temple which, or a Gothic cathedral, primarily designed to be appreciated by non-literate people, then you see a riot of... Um, psychedelic type imagery, I mean, demons and snakes wriggling everywhere in Hindu temples, psychedelic stained glass windows and Gothic cathedrals, amazing vegetational forms and structures and shapes. But it isn't a clearly, it isn't a smooth, unbroken development. It's that even between manuscript culture and print, there is an enormous leap that takes place because the psychology of manuscript culture is that you must look in order to understand. That's the essence of manuscript because it, no font is ever repeated. Uh, no, writing matters. no E looks like every other E. So you must look at manuscript. Reading is a, a reading of print is a very different psychological function because in the first few minutes of reading any text you assimilate the font 
from then on, you don't look at E's and F's and L's. You automatically assimilate them. It's always the same. There's no decipherment of the visual surface in the act of reading print in the way that there is reading manuscript. This is what McLuhan is talking about, of this linear, uniform, high-speed thing which sets up democracy and modern science and reproducible data and all these things that we take for granted or that we fail to examine deeply are an aspect not only of the linearity of print, that's been pretty well talked to death, but the uniformity of print and the curious way in which you don't have to actually look at it uh, sets us up for psychological blind spots that have closed us off to the reality of the visual world. Kind of a compression, narrowing of informational content of of medium. Uh, but then, since cinema, video, computers, and computer graphics, there's now going and expansion is in progress, which may expand well beyond any richness of media that history has seen before? Generally speaking, yes. The only caveat is that for the people who give their lives to this stuff, cinema is in no way seen as a precursor of television. Cinema is related to photography and related to the reconstruction of ordinary visual space. Television is a pixelated medium, very much like manuscript and not at all like photography because the in with photography the eye is not asked to work the eye beholds a photograph the eye decodes the television screen the fragmentation of the image makes it into an entirely uh, different medium well it's a matter of degree as with a uh, high definition television the resolution of video is increasing uh, due to the overusage of uh, the silver and, the, and the organic pigment and so on, the resolution of film is decreasing. Sometimes they'll meet computer graphics has the potential of resolution on the level of cinema. So let's think of a sequence then of manuscript, printed book, cinema. Okay, we'll skip television. Then we'll think of computer graphics. Um, well, television is related to the psychedelics. As interactive cinema, not as interactive video. I think that's appropriate. See, if these people are actually right in their analysis of the effects of these media, then high-definition television is not television at all and will not have the same effect that television has been having. In fact, high-definition TV may give a surprising shot in the arm to the, at this point, on-the-ropes, linear uniformitarians because it's going to be much more like cinema and photography and it's not going to have to be deciphered. It can be looked at and this will have unexpected consequences on the sense ratios and assumptions operating within no, the society. The video is doomed not because of a resolution limitation, but because it's not interactive. Computer gra an interactive computer graphic game where you can um, watch the soap opera, but also play with it, change the script, and so on, is bound to be much more interesting just because of interaction than video or cinema. More like a dream, in fact. More like a dream, in fact. Well, One, of, one yeah. of the things they've discovered that's very frustrating to the engineers in vir of virtual reality is they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, g getting fast enough computers so that when you turn your head, the scene uh, is reconstructed in the way that normal space is. But what's fascinating is they discover in virtual reality, people rarely turn their head, people know that they are in a television created space and they immediately lock into their long ingrained habits of watching television and people sit with the iPhones on like this. It's temporary. 
because they don't understand that if they're not watching TV and you have to tell them, turn your head, keep turning your head, stop sitting still. You do not have to stare at this. You say, oh, that's right, I don't have to stare at it. That's temporary because video and cinema are on their way out. I think the future of uh, cinema is that all the films ever made will be digitized and stored in a gigantic library where in the context of a uh, computer graphic VR parlor game, you can call up at will images from very, here's Cleopatra Salome or something, and put them on the walls around you. So, well, interactivity is, is the primary, I mean, this is the area where the com computer revolution and psychedelics are in convergent evolution. They are coming together in the interactivity, uh, but the extent to which the computer medium could be shared by a large number of people gives uh, an idea of a, a further advance in cultural uh, evolution beyond what was accomplished by hippies in the 1960s with psychedelics. Larger groups spread over space and time can um, come into morphic resonance with the same image. But this takes us to uh, another key point in the whole thing, which is that <clears throat> if, in relation to mathematics, um, since mathematics represents a particular realm of imagination, and for many mathematicians a particular realm of visual imagination, um, the, the, um, this is Ralph's chosen field, of course, that the normal way of communicating mathematical ideas is through a kind of symbolic structure as unrelated to the visions, as musical notation, as to the sounds you hear of the Mozart symphony. And uh, the secret which good mathematicians seem to have inherited or picked up almost by accident is that these symbols relate to what Francis Galton called mathematical landscapes, an inner imaginary space which creative mathematicians have. They see forms. He described how great mathematicians of his acquaintance reluctantly admitted when he questioned them closely to seeing landscapes with little balls and rolling down them and shapes changing before their very eye. This was how they did their mathematics. They then later translated and expressed it through symbols. Other mathematicians with this gift could somehow pick it up by a kind of resonance, the symbols acting as some medium that helped tune them to it. Um, and this is actually how um, at least many branches of mathematics have been carried out. It's still true today that good mathematicians have mathematical landscapes and mathematical imaginations, but this is a secret kept from most of us while studying mathematics in school um, or even university, where these symbols seem quite impenetrable, the manipulations you do with them seem quite arbitrary. Um, and it seems to me that one of Ralph's points is that the... Um, computer graphics revolution now makes these rather abstract mathematical systems previously only visualizable uh, by mathematics and even then to a limited extent uh, by mathematicians um, like fractals and so on immediately accessible to everybody so suddenly these abstract mathematical concepts or mathematical spaces now become common cultural artifacts and now have fractal sweatshirts and fractal imagery on printed fabrics and so on. Um, so, uh, so through computer graphics there's this opening up or democratizing of the mathematical imagination. Um, and I imagine uh, that um, when mathematicians take psychedelics that their already developed mathematical landscape um, undergoes an expansion, intensification or some other interesting development since mathematicians have this peculiar and unusual kind of visual imagination to start with. Is that the case? Yes, I think that uh, we could put this in the category of outing the unconscious, that for peculiar reasons, evolutionary mistakes, um, mathematics had actually gotten relegated to the unconscious, you see. Uh, and it does have to do with printed books, I'm sure. When mathematicians speak to each other, they wave their hands to draw pictures one line at a time on the board or with their hands in, in the space, and they speak um, simultaneously and in coordination, coordinated like 
like uh, dance is to music, the picture and words, so it requires the cooperation, the coordination of multiple modes of representation in order to communicate a mathematical idea from one trained mathematician to another. So when you see uh, colloquium talks, which are uh, per per public performances of mathematical creativity in the act, uh, performed live to an audience of people trying to understand, then you always see these visual um, dynapics, I call them, moving pictures with lyrics that are coordinated, done in a very artful way, using the room as uh, the, like the memory memory palace of Giornano Bruno and, and so on. Here's a, here's a space, this corner, and this is where this goes, and this, and the, everything is coordinated with space. The dance of the performer, the waving of the hands, the drawing on the blackboard, and the singing of the words succeeds by a telepathic miracle in computing, uh, communicating the idea. Then you have books, textbooks, for teachers to use in schools who aren't trained on this level or something. So you send in the book to a publisher with the drawings in the margin. The publisher writes back, uh, we can only have 100 line drawings in this book. That's the limit for financial reasons. So then you get a book which fails in the communication of the idea, even to a trained mathematician. And out of this tradition comes this heavy reliance on symbols which, for a person already trained in the, in the mathematical dance hall, actually do um, re reawake. They, they blow up the entire image. They recall it from practice, you know, in the memory field, a little icon. Uh, that's fine, but for somebody to learn mathematics from scratch in this way, it's impossible. So after this limitation on books, the transition from manuscripts to printed books. It was at that time that mathematics became arcane, was relegated to the unconscious. Along comes computer graphics. Suddenly mathematics becomes visible. Suddenly we have visual mathematics, visible mathematics uh, for the first time in a long while on a public scale on t-shirts and so on as Rupert said. So uh, I think that is true that mathematics is one key area which is uh, saved from oblivion by the computer revolution, making visual mathematics possible and part of the daily experience of, of anyone with a personal computer. Well, don't you think it's just part of a larger program of language generally becoming visible through the medium of the computer? That yes. what's happening is that language is about to conquer uh, the visual dimension and the mathematical shock troops have somehow gone over the top first yes, but exactly. ordinary language can hardly be far behind yes, the, the current uh, I don't know, the hot frontier of the computer revolution today is multimedia that means you'll have a CD and when you double click on the icon you get songs, mm -hmm. dancing, moving colored pictures, dramas, you know, a coordinated multimedia display created by expert best understanders of the subject, let us say how to repair a car or how this uh, tree grew from a seed and the morphogenetic field, the geometry of the soul, wh wherever you double click, you're going to get this multimedia show which is actually interactive. So let me see that again. Go back, slow down, and well, it's and the on. species mind, and it's nothing is happening except that what was previously wetware and driven by intuition is being made explicit as hardware and driven by a machine interface. Yeah, We're easy. downloading or uploading the unconscious into a cultural artifact, and it's gaining presence in the domain of culture through this process. You know, children's books, since I was reading to uh, Cosmo yesterday, and there's this book, which is, uh, it's got pictures, they're interactive, you can open the door, look inside, you see the crocodile, you close it, then you open this box, there's a snake in there, close it, you open the clock, there's a bird in there, and these uh, children's books from which children actually gain their initiation to a certain level of initiation of, uh, uh, yes, of, of awareness of the environment and so on, the language, the 
cognitive strategies for understanding all this. These books are much more successful, sophisticated, and rich than the books which are used to teach mathematics to advanced engineering students in universities. They're like crude DMT hallucinations. Yes. <laughs> so the best of the books are children's books, and uh, the, the computer revolution is now advancing to a point where um, they're sort of getting to the level of children's books as, as far as richness of medium is concerned, but there's a, a, a long way to go before they can approach, I mean, they'll never get there, the, the richness of experience of a psychedelic trip, either alone in a dark room or with a group of people exploring a flower. A long way to go. Mm. Well, coming back to the connection between psychedelics and the computer revolution, there are several ways one might look at it. One is, um, well, first the sociological fact as revealed both, both on the basis of anecdotal stories and on the survey carried out by the San Francisco Examiner. Out of 118 people questioned at the recent computer graphics convention in Nevada, um, 118 said that they had taken psychedelics. There was 100% psychedelic usage among leading figures in this field. Now, there's a sense in which other branches of the computer world are part of the linear language-based print type thing. The word processor, the commonest use of the computer in everyday life, is uh, an updated version of the typewriter and so on. It's not something that breaks radically with this tradition. It's in fact the colonizing of the visual space, the sort of television type visual space, by the, the printed word in, in, in a more luminescent form. Uh -huh. so, um, <clears throat> The, 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 in that area, we, we, people who uh, develop new word processing things or spreadsheets, um, the suggestion is that psychedelic usage is quite low and perhaps maybe a little higher than the rest of the population. But computer graphics is the area where there's this exceptionally high incidence, in fact, maximum incidence of psychedelic use. Now, I, I, I wonder whether it's because people who take psychedelics um, then want to find a career where somehow this incredible visual revelation can be followed through in some kind of technology and shared with others. A bit like some people who have amazing experiences with drugs then try and find ways of doing it through meditation or ways they can teach it to others without the drugs. Um, is that one of the reasons? Is it that people with visual imaginations are particularly drawn or influenced or um, amazed by psychedelics and um, they're the kind of people who go into computer graphics anyway. Um, what kind of causal link do we have here? Um, is it that when actually thinking about some realization of some program, uh, that the psychedelics can actually help the creative process as a kind of ongoing usage during this kind of uh, creative process? What do you think, Ralph? Well, I think in the creation of a new program, let us say, the first spreadsheet, the first text editor or something. There are all kind of concepts that have to be invented from scratch, just about the sort of the geometry of the space of information, the view, the filter, what information will be stored where, what's important, how to retrieve it, how to display it on the screen. All of this, an enormous amount of creativity is required because we're constructing a new space using tools that have never been touched before. So I, I think that all of these creations and uh, even in the aspect of computer revolution totally dominated by print, that these have been enormously aided by visual imagination, by visual skills, by cognitive strategies involving uh, geometric spaces and motion within them. So. Um, there, there could be expected uh, incidents of psychedelic usage among pioneers in those fields as well. But when it comes to computer graphics, I, I do think that all of these different possibilities you listed operate in parallel. I know from personal experience with my students that they were among the most interesting students attracted to study computer graphics are those with uh, psychedelic and other 
unusual experiences like traveling in foreign cultures and they are looking for jobs where they can just feel more comfortable and have a chance for success and maintain their integrity and they've chosen the computer graphic industry because it's more congenial or compatible and they mm. feel that what they're doing is uh, of value simultaneously it's probable that they are trained to succeed better in it than other people who would be better off as engineers creating new hardware devices like uh, high density memory or something, faster processors and the like, which is very linear um, engineering drawing oriented kind of thing. So uh, I, I think all, all of these things are true. There is a sort of a resonance between psychedelic experience and computer graphics and uh, I don't know which causes the other. You see, it could be that while working on a computer graphic program, you see the same picture over and over again. Finally, you get a kind of boredom sets in where you don't feel that it's like we can't sit at the typewriter sometimes because we don't want to stare at the page anymore. And uh, the print on the computer monitor does get really boring, and pictures do also. And it may be that people who don't have psychedelic recreation are not able to continue in the job. You see, after a year or two, they have to retire, whereas others have more longevity in that kind of work. I don't know, and I don't know how we can find out. Well, I mean, one is that finding out is more than natural out of curiosity, because as the ABC television network implied when they contacted you about this, this has enormous implications. If the US leads the world in computer graphics, and if the principal competitor is Japan, if the Japanese corporations haven't yet got programmers working in them who are onto psychedelics, then there are two possible consequences. One, the revelation of psychedelic usage in the US computer fraternity will alert the drug enforcement agencies in the United States to try and clean up Silicon Valley to the possible detriment and loss of world lead in this important aspect of US high technology. Second, the Fujitsu Corporation and others in Japan uh, may send their um, employees on crash courses in psychedelics, in which case they may well be getting in touch pretty soon with you and Terence to hire you as consultants for this process um, to try and unleash more creativity in Japan, assuming that the psychedelics haven't hit Japanese computer, corporate computer culture very much yet. Well, it's likely that rather than suppress psychedelics in the United States, they will simply have to accept them or accept second-rate status in one of the few fields where we still hold some advantage. Well, that's a possibility. I'm not sure if we even still hold an advantage as far as the uh, creative edge is concerned. In um, most of the large software companies, such as Borland, Microsoft, Santa Cruz Operation, and so on, I'm pretty sure that they do have drug testing, as they have, as they have at ABC News and so many other... To, to make sure that their programmers are taking sufficient psychedelics to well, stay on the cutting edge. Well, no, not. <laughs> oh, no? <laughs> come, come now, you're slacking off here. <laughs> No, but they're not that rational here. As I think they, they may be in Japan. The hysteria against drug usage in this country is not um, a rational program and probably will continue, even though it means that the United States has lost its place as a primary industrial nation. While uh, in, in Japan, where the large corporations have very enlightened leadership it seems with very clear goals and so on they may very study very well study the data coming in from the grassroots science groups all over the world and decide that they need to encourage certain teams working on the frontier of the computer revolution there where they are very keen to lead the world encourage these teams to begin experiments with 
psychedelics in uh, monitor the results carefully in a controlled way. And I think that's very likely. And I have always anticipated a shift of leadership in the uh, intellectual, scientific, and technical things away from the United States as the wave of European immigrants that came during World War II uh, die out. The American educational system has no way to replace them. It's a very poor educational system. So I think we've already seen this, that the leadership in technical in innovation has moved away from the United States, even in terms of computer software, computer graphics, and so on. Um, Europe and Japan are on the rise, and uh, the United States is in decline. So the conclusion is that civilization which welcomes psychedelics yes. is the civilization yes. that will lead and yes. rule the planet. Yes, that's the conclusion. <laughs> no. There you have it. <laughs> I think we can go a little further. Go for it. Um, well, one thing that I still haven't heard from Ralph is, in his, since I don't have a mathematical landscape, having never been told about such things when I was studying mathematics, having found the manipulation of these symbols quite meaningless and unsatisfying, having never been able to find out why you did these things, and therefore having abandoned mathematics like millions of others in despair, um, or just out of boredom or lack of engagement. Um, I'm curious to know from Ralph's experience, firstly, when he's doing mathematical um, Creative, creative work, how the visual imagination works, how this mathematical landscape works, what your particular landscapes are like. And secondly, under the influence of psychedelic drugs um, back over seven years ago, um, which uh, did you uh, find yourself in the presence of amazing, totally uh, astonishing visions? Uh, which were nothing much to do with your usual mathematical landscapes. Well, could you start from your um, habitual um, and well-known areas of mathematical landscape and then almost consciously and interactively develop them in new ways and form a kind of continuity between those and the visions uh, produced by substances such as DMT and LSD? Yes. Well, you know, between mathematics and physics, there's a big difference and there's a certain personality of person that would choose to be a physicist and a kind of an opposite type of person that would want to be a mathematician. Likewise within mathematics there are completely different continents as it were in the uh, mathematical universe and the usual map of this universe by historians of mathematics has three continents. They are algebra, that's the oldest one and uh, geometry and topology that comes later or this about the same time or maybe a little earlier and then very recently a new one which is uh, analysis, dynamics and, and so on. These three continents in the mathematical universe have totally different cognitive styles and algebra, I, I do, th I, I'm, I don't really act, I'm not active in algebra and I haven't been to that many talks by algebraists and I think that they make uh, they have pictures that are more like tables, not tables of data but classifications of things or something and they use uh, visual representations that you don't find in the book where they're not um, delightfully rich visual representations that are very direct representations of what they're studying. They're like auxiliary things. The um, geometry, of, of course, is an extrapolation of ordinary experience in space and time. Uh, in space, anyway, let's say. So there are figures of triangles, spheres, a tori, and, and so on. These cannot be really brought in any way without visual representation. <coughs> Mathematicians, geometers learn tricks for visualizing higher dimensions. That's one of the main things. Or you could say the mathematical skills, the geometrical skills of our culture has evolved a little by little primarily through the development of 
cognitive tricks based on visual representations of higher dimensions. Higher dimensions, uh, well, for the three dimensions is represented in two by perspective. That's some kind of trick. And there was a day in the 14th century when this trick was discovered by somebody and communicated to somebody else and became a major innovation in the history of painting. And the third uh, continent in the mathematical universe of analysis and dynamics, this it, it has some kind of history from um, classical Greek times through the Middle Ages and so on, but primarily it's associated with a recent beginning with uh, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so on. This is geometry with motion. So the visual strategy is necessary to to think and work in this area of development is uh, is the geometry with motion so is a more complex visual cognitive strategy than had ever been attempted before of course it's relating to, to dance to running through the woods to catching a ball and so on it's, there's there's dynamics in human experience and every child is a dynamicist in learning to um, master the functions of the body, locomotion, and so on. So, um, that's the background, and I had worked in geometry, topology, and in analysis, or there's a kind of analysis, classical analysis, which has uh, symbolic representations of very great complexity and magnitude. For example, there are books where there's a formula F equals on page one, and it goes on for over 300 pages of a single formula. To understand what it says, you have to assemble all these pages in your head and be able to scan it like this, like Ricci's Memory Palace. And there are people who are trained to do that. The slightest comma out of place and so on. That's another kind of visual trick, which is indirect, like the algebraists. And then... Um, yes, uh, by the time I started using psychedelics, I had already passed through this uh, development and had published papers on dynamics, I mean geometry and motion in very high dimensions, which required an act actual visualization of four, six, or eight dimensions, down to the level of being able to remove the carburetor, replace something inside, and put it back on that much. So. So then what happened to me with psychedelic visualizations is that I saw, and um, first of all I saw the visual reality that's revealed in that way from the perspective of a kind of a trained observer of higher dimensions. So I could recognize a lot of uh, phenomena. I could remember them, put them, take them out, combine them in new forms, and, and so on, just because of this training. I guess I specialized in the enjoyment of the physical realms revealed. And also what I perceived did seem to be elaboration of an extension of the maximum visual capability I ever had before was then, um, with, even with marijuana, I would say, the first smoke was it extended enormously. So, although I, when I first smoked marijuana, I didn't have an extensive visual hallucination. Still, what I did observe, um, details of the relationship between two people, for example, I then imaged these in a way using visual representative tricks, which were beyond those that I'd used before. So the resonance, the connection, you know how it is that you can rove over. The connection between mathematical visualization extended and the perception of ordinary reality. This was, you know, f uh, fused in a very interesting fashion. I can tell this story, I guess, that I hadn't really made this connection before. The one that I, uh, I, I, I mentioned in Invention um, is a counterexample of a conjecture of Smale in 1966, I think, called the Omega Stability Conjecture. And um, here, here's what happened. I was introduced to marijuana by some students at Princeton where I was teaching mathematics. I had gone to the dormitories, which is where they sat smoking, and smoked a joint. Then I had to walk home. While walking home, 
maybe this was in the summer anyway, I remember it was warm, but probably it was spring, the spring of 1966. The path between the dormitory and my home, which was on the campus, passed you know, hall where my office was on the first floor and close to the path. And in passing it, I heard that the telephone was ringing. So being a, you know, compulsive good boy, I ran and took my key, opened the door and picked up the phone. It was Steve Smale calling from Berkeley. He said, I have this new idea about omega stability and I wanted to check it out with you and see if you think it's plausible or not. He told me the omega stability conjecture. Never heard anything like it before, that these um, says the omega limit says if they have hyperbolic structure and then perturbations and so on. Oh, that's very interesting, Steve. I said, it's wrong. Instantly, there flashed in my mind the picture, which I described to him on the telephone. I was stoned. This is maybe one of the first examples of stoned mathematics, and it's still one of my best-remembered publications, I would say. Oh, no, Steve, that's wrong, because if you had in four dimensions the following configuration with the two dimensions out here and the one dimension in there with the intersection of this transversal and so on, I described this picture in four dimensions. Well, he has, uh, maybe it's in six dimensions, I can't remember right now, but it's something that there's hardly anyone in the world could visualize unless they were, I'm like, here's the guy who could do it, Steve Smale. You, my God, you're right. He said, oh, shit. Oh. So then, <laughs> I, that was it, a short telephone call. I went to, on home, I went to bed. And in the subsequent two, three days, we talked on the telephone a couple of times, and we wrote a joint paper, which was published in 1968 in the you know, plenary volume of this Global Analysis Conference, which was, it was really the climax of 1960s mathematics. Let me ask you a question, Ralph. Do you think that uh, the psychedelics propel you into the realm of mathematical truth in the ordinary sense that that's imagined, or that all we can ever perceive is the workings of our own minds, and so no the mathematical landscape is the neurological landscape, and that it's the, the structure of the brain defines the limit set of possible mathematical objects. This goes to the question of whether mathematics is a uh, species-bound, specialized, localized human activity, or whether it's discovering God's uh, truth in the universe. Well, this may be one of those unanswerable questions. You could ask the same question about ordinary reality. I mean, here it is. Is this a uh, neurological construct with a history of other neurological constructs? Or is there actual grass there and here's a tree and that's a bird? Well, what do you think? So what I think is that the ordinary reality is really there. And is there, even if all, everyone in our species should become extinct and uh, we're all dead and a lot of these things die, and so there's still, I think, ordinary reality is really ordinary and really real. And I think the same about the mathematical landscape, that it's been there, it's evolving, it's there with and without us, and as we travel there, we have these... Um, Cristoforo Colombo and the Vasco da Gama and so on of the mathematical landscape. They go on out there, they find the footprints of some other explorer, they follow them, they find where that person turned around and came back, they camp out, they pitch their tent there, they hang out for a while, they go a little further out and come back, they write a report, they send it back. These different reports are integrated into our cultural map of this other actual reality, which is much richer than this one, and much more complex and hard to grok. So we haven't really got much of it yet. It's is vast, and for me, one of the most exciting aspects of psychedelic traveling has been to go miles farther. <laughs> Where no man has gone before. Well, do you think then that a hypothetical civilization of extraterrestrials on the other side of the galaxy doing mathematics will uh, discover and describe the same objects that you and yes. your colleagues discover Absolutely. and describe? It would be a um, fantastic coincidence if there's this enormous landscape and they travel a a lot, and then we traveled a lot, there might not be any intersection at all. There could be planets where there was a mathematics which had the same reality and so on, and yet there was no overlap. But since, you know, one to three, I mean, numbers, there's some things that are so natural to be early discoveries in the mathematical landscape that I, I would think that there would be 
an overlap uh, between the mathematics of this planet and the mathematics of any other. So if we were then to then encounter this extraterrestrial civilization, any mathematical discoveries that it had made, if we could get in communication with them, would be rationally apprehendable to us. We wouldn't just say, well, that's a Zell construct, and we humans don't, uh, we can't grok the Zell construct. Our brains are organized differently. Well, it might take a while. It might take a few generations. I think that our exploration of the mathematical landscape has been slow, and maybe slow of necessity. There is this idea that the discovery of a mathematical structure requires a certain neural net connectivity development, and that there is a co-development, co-evolution between the mathematical discovery and the neurolog the, the connectivity, actually. The, structures within the mind mimicking, empowering the representation of structures that are discovered in the mathematical landscape. So they could come to us with a mathematical structure that we could not dock, although in principle it was explainable. The development of the language, the development of the capabilities to understand it so might take several generations, just as we now see ourselves, our children and so on, struggling to understand uh, the shapes in the reality of the computer revolution. So you're more, it would be fair to call you as a mathematical Platonist rather than a mathematical relativist. Yes. Yes, in our previous conversations on this topic, you denied. Yes, I was going to point And insisted on the reply usually adopted by mathematicians on the defensive that these are merely provisional models produced by the human mind. We use as long as they suit us and we drop when they not, not so. And that if well, uh, there's any objective existence at all, this is an evolving structure rather than an eternally fixed platonic one that somehow is co-evolving along with our imaginations. Yes, this well, is the position I've had you adopt. Yes, no, this is a little confused. I, I, I'm a Platonist. I accept your idea of the evolution and the role of creativity in the mathematical landscape and that this uh, creativity is interactive with human activities on the mathematical frontier. So I accept that. This is kind of a modified Platonism. About the um, relativity of the models, we have to distinguish between mathematical structures, mathematical objects, such as uh, chaotic attractors and so on. On the one hand, and a model built out of them for something in a laboratory situation or ordinary reality, on the other hand, I've said that uh, scientists, especially physical scientists, tend to identify the model with the target system. They have Maxwell's equations for the electro and magnetic field with the E and the B and so on, and then they think that the E and the B are actually physically existing fields. And uh, I reject that. But the E and the B and their relationship as expressed in the formula is an important kind of mathematical object which has its own real existence in the mathematical landscape. And the modeling function is applied mathematics, is the thesis, is the way in which mathematics can serve us as a cognitive strategy for understanding the world around us. That it is possible to take these mathematical objects, to use them as tinker toys, to put them together into a model, which in some way is something like the experience of our culture, our laboratory, our test tube, our ozone layer, or whatever. And through this relationship between one particular carefully constructed mathematical model and our experimental scientific observation of uh, nature around us, to gain understanding and to see relationships in, in a clearer way. But the models are not real in the sense they are identified with ordinary reality, but the models are real in the sense that they are actual existing objects in the constructed in the mathematical landscape. Well, their nature and their kind of reality would be the, of the nature of field structures, I should imagine, since I think of the mind as being a system of fields. 
fields being spatio-temporal yeah. pattern yeah. regions. Mm. Um, so if the mind is, if our minds are basically made up of mental fields, the mathematical landscapes have as their underlying substrate in the mental field, that would be the kind of basis of the mathematical landscape or of its objective existence. Yes. I'd go further and think of them as morphic fields transmissible by morphic resonance. Yes. Um, then, since uh, our view of the nature of the so-called the external world or the physical world is also one which science reveals to us is made up of organizing fields. Yes. Uh, modeling fields by means of fields yes. would indeed be rather a good way of going about it because the models would have the same kind of qualities as Absolutely. things being modeled. Um, uh, namely, they'd be field structures, in other words, structures of extended interrelationship or patterns in space-time. Yes. Space-time uh, mathematics has been defined recently in the monthly notices of the American Mathematical Society as the study of patterns in space and time. Interesting. So then the field, and indeed, since fields, the principal metaphor from which fields are derived is agricultural fields, which are structures in landscapes, then the very metaphor of the mathematical landscape, or in Oddington's terms, the epigenetic landscape, relates us automatically against this whole field concept. Yes. The mathematical mm. objects, so called, I guess, are creoles mm. in this field. And so then psychedelics would enable um, the exploration of different regions of this field, these fields, to be explored. Just the metaphor of exploring would be quite appropriate. I mean, if we're exploring the countryside, then we go through fields and ecosystems and things which can also be thought of as fields. So there's an exploration process. Yes, it uh, seems to be a, an amplifier for resonance, something like putting helium in a violin. Well, Whitehead defined understanding as the apperception of patterns as such. And that means then that what you're, def you're saying that mathematics is understanding. If mathematics is the study of patterns and understanding is the apperception of patterns as such, then mathematics and understanding are suddenly seen to be uh, two names for the same program of mental activity. That's one way, I guess you could say that. Then, of course, that's Whitehead who would see understanding as primarily a mathematical function. Who was the both word, a Platonist and a mathematician. The word apperception, I think, comes from Leibniz during his period when Correct. he was writing in, in, in French. And so we have to think of him also proposing the monads as fundamental units um, of the intellectual medium. Patterns, atomic creodes from which to construct more complicated space-time patterns suitable for modeling everything. Mm. Yes, monads are the atoms of the so uh, mathematical universe. So we've arrived here from psychedelics and the computer revolution to psychedelics as amplifiers in the monadological method of understanding. That by showing us pattern as such. And computer graphics, is it not the makes it explicit tool for doing monadology, where we have this CD full of fundamental monads, which can then be combined in a kind of virtual reality, which is then the model for a certain real experience, or perhaps it is the real experience, depending on... You know, well, it makes the pattern explicit, it rather than... Dimensions. It still yes. has the same kind of reductive capacity as the photograph. It's well, but not, for, not for, for, for instance, in virtual reality. I mean, they're talking about virtual realities where you will go into well, Seahorse Valley of the Mantelbrot set and camp there for several weeks, uh, exploring goggles. around. In the, 3D with goggles. Yes. Still, it's... Um, if these, if mathematical imaginations exist in higher dimensions, still bringing it down. I mean, but usually it's 2D. I mean, these yes. fractal pictures, chaotic yeah, 3D attractors. are really trying to visualize something in much higher dimensions. So these are attempts to represent something which is experienced in a 
higher dimension and communication. It says that the human EEG has a dimension around six and a half. So probably this isn't exactly right, but um, it is believed that if dimension is too high, you can't understand. If it's too low, you can't represent anything. Let's just imagine that a lot of natural phenomena are basically six, seven, or eight dimensional. Then certainly, whether it's 2D or 3D, where we're representing them, it doesn't matter much. It, you hardly, you know, at the front door of understanding what's going on. But then, what about? Um, well, the one point just to follow up this other thing is the um, mathematics and understanding. There's this whole range of possible fields or field structures that can be explored through mathematics. But of course, the realm of mathematics is perhaps vastly greater than the realm of physical reality we encounter. So I, there are far more mathematical structures around than there are things that we can map them onto, and we find ones which correspond more or less. To so something that we can recognize. Yes, but a lot don't correspond to anything we know about, at least on this planet. Uh, however, then aesthetics comes in here. Beauty itself becomes uh, a criteria for the selection of mathematical objects, and in fact, this has been historically true. Yes. But then there's, there's a further point, which is that just as mathematicians communicate with, with each other through a kind of resonance, where they can transfer the picture, the, the intuition, the gestalt, from one to the other by means of symbols, dances, halting phrases. Somehow it can just be transferred. Um, has anyone ever tried um, doing this in a psychedelic state? Say you had a, a room of mathematicians um, and they were taking a, a substance like ayahuasca which produces on the one hand a kind of empathetic group mind and on the other hand the visionary state. Would it be possible greatly to enhance this possibility of communication that happens in the colloquium room by means of this dance. Has that ever been, in your experience, tried? Well, am I, uh, I think, as far as I can remember, in my group psychedelic experiences, there was never another major mathematician. But still, any person, to some extent, is a mathematician and uh, has these modes of perception and mm. uses them as cognitive strategies and so on. I found that the ability to evoke these images in someone else through just saying something and waving your hands is enormously enhanced in the shared psychedelic atmosphere. It is. Amazingly, resonance is definitely amplified and therefore you can have success in communication that you have never dreamed, which is kind of a spoiler. Really, well, it, a gesture like the guru in the jungle, you know, uh, some little signs, and the person really has the whole idea, and then they respond, and the communication is very rapid, and even without, just in some telepathic way, there is an apparent resonance, a merging of minds, as it were. They can even visualize these minds like floating up to the ceiling and somehow uh, docking with each other, and then becoming one thing, and I have in this way created what appears to be what you could describe as a telepathic union of, with a person in uh, such a two or three person psychedelic trip. I, I remember one with uh, Kenny and Ellis where the three souls merged and a telepathic bond was connected which was never broken. It didn't end with the psychedelic trip after uh, I think that we took various things and were stoned together for three days. After this, we always knew when something was happening with the other one, we could call up and say, what's going on? And so well, it sounds to me like group ayahuasca taking among research mathematicians is a tremendous frontier a for tremendous grassroots frontier. science. Yes. And exactly.